Okay, so the webinar is being recorded. So I'm, I'm glad to announce the, the first talk of the morning. Uh, Ivan Marti Vidal from the University of Valencia will talk to us about the polarization calibration in CASA. Yes, Please start. I'm going to share the screen. Okay. Oh, excellent. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, fantastic. So uh, let's start. Hi, everybody. Good morning or good afternoon or whatever. <laughs> Uh, so let's start about polarization calibration in VLBI, okay, which, as you will see, has some peculiarities, okay, that make it um, especially, especially troublesome sometimes, okay, but, but uh, yeah, hopefully um, we will, uh, uh, sorry, it's very early in the morning here, or <laughs> I spent a very bad night <laughs> yesterday. Okay, so let's start from the beginning, uh, some basic concepts, okay. Um, so I think that the most important concept to understand polarimetry in, 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 uh, in interferometry and in VLBI in particular is what we call the instrumental polarization, okay? Because in our data, we have the combination of two things, well, as, as always, but in polarimetry, it's especially, it's especially troublesome. You will see why. Uh, the case of the instrumental polarization, which is modeled by the Dittons, okay? So uh, when you have a radio telescope, basically you have to split the signal that comes from the sky into two orthogonal polarizations, okay? And the way you do it depends on the technology of your antenna, okay? You can use or ortho mode transducers uh, at lower frequencies. You can use uh, some high-tech uh, stuff at very high frequencies like, like reflection, gratings, and so on, okay? So uh, depending on the, on the frequency and the technology of your antenna, you have very different approaches. You also uh, have to convert polarizations in different ways. For instance, in VLBI, you convert into circular using quarter wave plates, or you can also use software. That's the case of, of, of pole converts, OK? The point is that none of these technologies, none of these devices is perfect, OK? So signals from one polarization are usually leaked into the other. By, that, by, by leaking, I mean that uh, the, the the right circular polarization that you record in your backend is not pure right. It has a little bit of left circular polarization and the other way around. And this leaked signal has a given amplitude and also have a, a given phase, okay? Because if you have a, a feedback in your, in your backend, for instance, then the, the, the signal that is being leaked in, from one polarization to the other has some delay, okay? Which you see as a phase, okay? So indeed, what you have is a, like a complex and by complex, I mean uh, mathematically complex with an amplitude and a phase, okay? Combination of different polarization channels, okay? The way we model this leakage is using a, a, a quantity that depends on each antenna and each polarizer, quantity that we call D-term, okay? So D-term is the amplitude, gives us the amplitude and the phase of the signal that is being leaked from one polarization channel, okay, into the other polarization channel, okay? So that's the thing we want to model. We want to fit uh, with, uh, with our calibration approaches in order to apply it before we build the full polarization image, because otherwise our images, our polarization images will be fully corrupted by, by the instrumental effects, okay? So in order to understand how we perform this polarimetric calibration, we need to understand uh, the, um, the, the uh, well, it's, it's better to understand the measurement equation formalism, okay, which you already saw yesterday uh, uh, a couple of times, okay? Uh, so basically this is what relates, what we call the visibility matrix, which is a funny combination of the, 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 the brightness distribution of, of the four Stokes parameters of your source, I, Q, U, and B. This, uh, this is the, Oh, sorry, that's the other way around. So this is the visibility matrix. That means the uh, correlation of the different uh, polarization products among, among antennas. And this is what we call the brightness matrix, which gives us uh, the, this funny combination of Stokes parameters of your source. We will see. We will see it uh, 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 in more detail in a few slides. And these J's here are the Jones matrices, okay, of the two antennas, which encode the information of all the gain and instrumental polarization uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, the, of your instrument, okay? So uh, you can actually compare this equation to the classical interferometer equation, where instead of having matrices, we have, a, we have a scalars, okay? So instead of having Jones matrices, we have just numbers, okay? Uh, complex numbers that, gives us, that give us the gains of the antennas, okay? In this case, we only care about the total intensity, or, or what we call Stokes I, okay? So uh, the jump 
from a Stokes eye to the full Stokes formalism is basically a jump from the uh, classical interferometer equation into the, the, the radio interferometer uh, measurement equation. Okay, so you just change the scalars by matrices. One of these matrices, which is particularly important for us, is what we call the parallactic angle rotation. Okay, so here you see a, a, an animation that tries to explain what is parallactic angle. So, so when you observe, for instance, with an antenna that has an alt azimuthal mount, the orientation of this uh, that you see on the sky would correspond to the white box here, okay, which is always uh, vertical and horizontal, okay, because of the mount of the antenna. Whereas the orientation of the source, as it is seen by the antenna, would follow the, the green line here, okay, so because the sky is rotating. So in the end, what you have is that the, the two frames, the frame of your receiver and the frame of your source, what we call the receiver frame and the sky frame, they are rotated by a time variable quantity that we call parallactic angle, okay? So depending on the, on the polarization basis of your observations, if you have linear polarization fits or circular polarization fits, you have, you have um, different, different, uh, different uh, equations or different, yeah, different shape for the same operator, okay? Which is the, the parallactic angle rotation, okay? So in VLBI, it's good to apply it before the phase and any delay rate calibration. So before the fringe fit fitting, because otherwise your fringe fitting solutions will be contamined by the time evolution of the parallactic angle, okay? And then you, you will mix uh, apples to oranges, let's say, okay? So it's before to apply it well before the, the, the fringe fitting. It's, it's not problem because it's deterministic, so you can apply it with no problem if you, as long as you have circular polarizers, okay, which is one of the reasons why we use circular polarizers in, in VLBI. So um, one detail that we should not forget, well, it's, not, it's, uh, it's not important for, for VLBI because of the use of circular polarizers, but it's critical in the, general, in the more general case, is that uh, in the measurement equation, when we give the visibility matrix, we usually give it in the receiver frame, okay? So these are measured at the, at the back end of the, uh, from the correlations uh, entering the back end of the antenna, and hence this is measured in the receiver frame, okay? Whereas the brightness matrix is usually given in the sky frame, okay? Because the Stokes parameters reflect the brightness distribution of the source that rotates with the sky, okay? As we see it from the earth. So these two uh, uh, matrices are given in different frames. We have to translate one to the frame of the other if we want to compare them in the measurement equation, okay? So in the case of circular polarization fits, uh, the rotation is trivial. It's, it's a diagonal matrix. So the parallactic angle uh, uh, rotation is just a diagonal matrix which commutes with every other diagonal matrix. And that means that we can just plug it in the, uh, wherever we want, okay? It's very easy to handle, okay? And actually, if you apply this, if you apply the parallactic angle rotation to, let's say, the, the brightness matrix and put it in the receiver frame from the sky frame, you see that the only difference between this matrix, which is in the sky frame, and this matrix that is in the receiver frame is just, is just a phase, okay? It's very easy to handle programmatically. It's just a phase that you add to the, to the I plus V and I minus V, so the parallel hand correlations, and a different phase that you add to the cross hand uh, uh, correlations. And these deltas are just the, the sum and the difference of parallactic angles at antennas A and B, okay? So, so absolutely no problem in handling this. It's so easy that you usually forget that the matrices are given in different frames, okay? Because it's pretty automatic for VLBI. Okay, so uh, examples of Jones matrices, which are, uh, remember, are given in the receiver frame, okay? Are, for instance, the gain matrix, okay? Which you also saw yesterday. Bandpass matrix, okay, all this has already been seen up, uh, um, in, the in the previous days, and the polarization leakage. Here you have the D-terms that we were talking about in the first slide, okay, the D-terms that leak signal, that, that model, sorry, model the leak of signals from one polarization to the other. All of these are given in the receiver frame, okay? So uh, remember, I, I insist, the Jones matrices are defined in and should be applied on the receiver frame. But for the case of circular fits, general case in VLBI, the, the, these two frames are related by a diagonal matrix. So indeed, it, it doesn't matter. It doesn't care much about the difference between receiver and sky frames. It's pretty automatic translation, okay? So let's, let's, uh, let's actually see what happens with these matrices, gain, bandpass, uh, and polarization leakage 
when we change from one frame to the other, okay, from the sky frame into the receiver frame, it's just some matrix algebra. You know how to to, to rewrite uh, uh, matrices in different in different frames. It's just multiplying by the the, the matrix and its and its inverse at its side of the of the of the um, of the equation, okay. And when you do the maths, okay, I will not do it now. But when if you do the maths, you arrive to a very interesting conclusion. And this is the key of the question, okay. This is this is the reason why we can calibrate polarimetry in in interferometry, especially in VLBI. If you write the gain matrix in the sky frame, it looks exactly the same as the gain matrix in the receiver frame, okay. So that means that if if a given antenna phase is rotated ninety degrees. In the sky frame, it also rotates 90 degrees in the, in the receiver frame. Okay, so rotations look the same in the sky frame and in the receiver frame. It's just an absolute rotation what matters, but all changes of angles in one frame are exactly the same as in the other frame. But look what happens. Look at what happens with the leakage. It's it's like a little bit of magic here, because the leakage is sensitive to this rotation. Actually, the leak the deterns rotate twice as much. As the rotation the, between the sky frame and the receiver frame, okay. So the leakage does care about this rotation between the sky frame and the receiver frame, okay. So gains are independent of parallactic angles, whereas D terms do depend on parallactic angle and, and actually depend quite a bit because they rotate twice as much, okay. Um, so in short, what happens is is that since the D terms depend on parallactic angle. We can use the parallactic angle variability, so, so the Earth rotation, basically. We can use the Earth rotation to decouple the instrumental polarization, which would, which would rotate with the antenna frame or the receiver frame, to the effect coming from the intrinsic polarization of the source, which rotates with the sky. Okay, Since both rotate in different frames and the D-terms are sensitive to these rotations, then we can decouple them from the source structure polarization. Okay, this is the main reason why we can do polarimetry in VLBI. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to decouple ones from the others when we do decouple instrumental polarization from source polarization. So this is the mother of all uh, polarimetry in in interferometry. Okay, the fact that the details do rotate with the frames. Okay. Now, we use this rotation in order to decouple, as I have said, the instrumental polarization from the source polarization. And the way it has been done uh, classically in apes is via a program, a software called LPCAL, okay? Um, which only, only works on apes, okay? At the moment in CASA, there, as far as I know, there is, there is no official task to handle uh, uh, specially resolved polarization calibrators. So I will talk about you an alternative, which also works in CASA, but it's not official, called PolSolve, okay? So let me now uh, briefly tell you about the details of these two algorithms and how they handle the source structure. So, yeah, the problem of VLBI polarimetry is basically the problem of a special resolved polarization calibrators. If the calibrators were point-like, were not resolved, there wouldn't be much trouble. Okay, the pro the, the the problem becomes trivial actually. But if you but if you have uh, uh, some structure in your brightness distribution of the different Stokes parameters, then you're in trouble because the problem is not trivial anymore. Okay, uh, at the moment there are several tools. Uh, which has which have been developed, as you can see from the dates here, quite quite <clears throat> they are quite new. Okay, well the oldest one is is LPCAL, okay, which was developed in the 90s. But as you can see, there has been some work uh, related to interferometric polarimetry in the in the last years. Okay, you have for instance GPCAL by John Ho, who I think may be in the call because he, he was registered as a participant. Okay. Who has developed a, a, a wrapper, a, I think it's a parcel tongue wrapper or a diff map wrapper. Um, uh, that uh, that uh, overcomes some limitations of LPCAL. And at the moment, as far as I know, I, I insist, maybe I'm mistaken, but as far as I know, the only tool based on CASA that would handle especially resolved polarization calibrators is, is PolSolve, okay? Uh, the, all these pseudonyms ba are based on inverse modeling, which is the, the kind, this is the, the, the clean style, okay? Where we retrieve the model directly from the data. Whereas you have also other alternatives of uh, with forward modeling, which is like like the maximum uh, entropy approach, okay, where the mo where you start with a model and then you approach the model to the data, okay. There are other alternatives which have nothing to do with inverse, neither inverse or forward modeling, which is the the Markov chain Monte Carlo sampling, where you basically use the brute force approach of sampling the whole parameter space, okay. And there are also two softwares. Um, 
to very, very new softwares, okay, that, uh, that can handle with this. So, so uh, based on, on uh, now just focusing on LPCAL and PolSolve, okay, I'm going to talk to you about the two approaches, okay, used to model this structure contribution from the source polarization, okay? So the one that is classic, that was classically used uh, with LPCAL is what we could call the slicing approach, okay? With the slicing approach, you what you do is basically to divide the source into, polar into what we call polarization subcomponents, okay? So imagine that these are the clean components of a source, okay? These are, these are basically you have two blobs, okay? You have very close by deltas, clean deltas in one, in one uh, in one region, and then separated from them, you have another set of delta. So it is your clean model, okay, with no convolution with any beam. And then uh, the way to model the polarization uh, the polarization structure with with LPCAL would be to divide the source, let's say, into two subcomponents, with which we call S0 and S1. Sorry, my birds are getting crazy. <laughs> and um, what we do is basically to assume, this is the basic assumption, and I would say the basic limitation of LPCAL. It assumes that each one of these subcomponents has a constant fractional polarization. So, so all these deltas are polarized exactly the same way within the subcomponent S0. And the same thing for these ones here, okay? So whereas the model visibility for the Stokes I is just the, the, the Fourier transform of, of the sum of all these components, the visibility, the model visibilities for the Stokes Q and U separates these components by the subcomponents. Okay, so it assumes that all the fractional polarization of each one of these deltas within each subcomponent is constant. Okay, and then I'll pick out what, what it does is to fit the D terms, the antenna D terms, together with these values QS and US. Okay, so it solves for the instrumental polarization and also solves for the constant fractional polarization that you have within each one of these subcomponents. So this is what we call the slicing approach, okay? We divide the source in pieces, and then we assume that each piece has a, a, a constant fractional polarization across it, okay? That's the, the LPCAL approach. It has some limitations, obviously, uh, especially if, the, if you have a very rich polarization brightness distribution that is not exactly proportional to Stokes I within the subcomponent, then basically you can't model this using this approach, okay? And that would actually map into biases in your instrumental polarization, okay? So as I, as I have, uh, as, I, I, as I just said, okay, the, the antenna details and the subcomponent polarization are fitted together, okay, using this approach. There's another approach, uh, which, which was suggested by Bill Cotton a long time ago, it's a paper in year 93, which is the polarization, we could call it polarization self-calibration where instead of dividing the source in, in slices, we basically let each clean component who has its own fractional polarization and EDPA independent of the others, okay? So we leave everything free in the, in the, to the model of, uh, of, the, of the Stokes Q and U, okay? But instead of fitting, of course, that would be crazy to fit in, the, in your fitting exactly this, uh, well, with different polarization for each clean component, you would have a lot of free parameters, okay? And it would get crazy. So the, the approach we follow with this Paul Selfcal is to fix the, the, the fractional polarization from your clean model. So you basically clean all Stokes parameters. You clean Stokes I, Q, U, and V, and then you fix the clean model in all Stokes parameters. You fix it, and you just fit for the D terms, okay? So you fix the source polarization that you have cleaned, okay? You hope that the source polarization will not depart much from the true source uh, brightness distribution, and then you just fit for the details. This is basically the same as what we do with Stokes I when we perform hybrid imaging. So this is like self-calibration, but instead of solving for the gains, we solve for the details. Okay, it's that's that's uh, basically the same. So okay, it's the same the same philosophy. Okay, fixing the source and then fit for the instrumental polarization. So the LPCAL algorithm uh, uh, only handles the slicing approach. So, so uh, uh, it only works by dividing the source in slices with assumed constant fractional polarization. And here you have the equation that is used by LPCAL, okay? So it's solving in the sky frame. So it rotates the D terms to the sky frame and then solves there, applying a linear uh, approximation to the model. So even though you, saw, you see that this is quite, looks quite a, 
uh, a messy equation, it's actually a linear model with all your fitting parameters, QS, US, and the D-term. So that means that you can perform just an ordinary least squares minimization. It's just a matrix inversion, and you are done, okay? It's a, it's a very straightforward. <laughs> it doesn't seem to be, but it is actually a straightforward algorithm, okay? You solve the D-terms directly with just a matrix inversion. It's very convenient. But it has the limitations that I have just uh, told you a few, a few minutes ago. The pole solve algorithm is similar to LPCAL, okay? But the, there are some differences. The, the error function is, for instance, computing the receiver frame. It should be mathematically equivalent, okay? But I, I think it's more elegant to work on the receiver frame to solve for the D-terms. And, and what is more important, in my opinion, is that it uses a nonlinear model, okay? So it uses the full measurement equation, including the nonlinear effects that come from the instrumental polarization, okay? Which in cases of the strong instrumental polarization and or high intrinsic source polarization, it can be helpful. Okay, it can it can it can be more accurate than than, than LPCAL. Okay, uh, how do these compare? Okay, so I made some comparisons with uh, synthetic observations. I simulated an uh, an observation with the Event Horizon Telescope using a, a subset of antennas. Okay, simulated a double source with a very high fractional polarization. The details were not that high; were of the order of less than ten percent. Okay, which well, I think I, I would say that it's the normal. Uh, quantities that you can that you can find, especially at high frequencies, and uh, well, this this was the simulated double source, okay, uh, which has a strong fractional polarization, which is different in its subcomponent, and if you uh, if you fit the D-terms with LPCAL in apes, this is the correlation between the true D-terms and the fit the it is fitted by apes. These are the residuals. So it does a pretty good job, actually. LPCAL does a pretty good job, even though the polarization was so high. But if you now solve with pole solve, you see that the residuals uh, are, 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 are lower, basically because of the, of the nonlinear uh, contribution uh, to the model. Okay, So accounting for nonlinear effects actually helps Okay, and gives you more accurate uh, solutions. Now, how do we use pole solve? So how do we do VLBI polarimetry with CASA, basically? So first thing is to download the code, okay? It's not an official task, okay? It's an unofficial task. So you have to do to go to, to, to Launchpad where the code is being, uh, is being maintained, okay, at the moment. Uh, it's part of a, of a, of a toolbox of, for a VLBI polarimetry, actually. You don't find only pole solve. You also find other, other tasks, like, for instance, pole simulate, okay? Which is just to generate um, VLBI simulations with CASA. Actually, uh, the EVN uh, simulations that I was showing in the first talk, okay, the, those EVN simulations were done with Pulse Simulate, okay, which I think is a very nice alternative to SimObserve for VLBI observations because SimObserve has some limitations for VLBI which are overcome by Pulse Simulate, okay. So you have Pulse Simulate, you have Pulse Solve, and you have CC Extract, which uh, is a way of, uh, of uh, helping uh, Pulse Solve to to divide the source into slices if you want to use the slicing approach as in LPCAL, okay? So, so you have plenty of, of, uh, of features uh, there in, in, in CASA poll tools. So after you have downloaded it, you, you just have to compile it and install, okay? So it's as easy as running this uh, command, okay? From the, from the directory where you downloaded the code, okay? So run the binary that, of Python that comes with CASA. Okay, of course, this only works with CASA uh, 5.6, 5.7, so it will not work with CASA 6. Okay, and then once you have compiled the code, you just run build my tasks from the same directory and then just update your uh, init.py, okay, so that the tasks will be will be available, okay? So it's, it's in principle, it's easy. And if you load uh, pull solve into CASA, you'll see it's, it's a normal CASA task, okay? So, so I he, here I have... Uh, I have uh, marked the keyword that I consider more interesting for you, the visibility, the measurement set, basically. Spectral windows that you want to fit for. You can set all spectral windows together. You can also fit a, what I call a multi-IF fit, which allows you to, to, uh, to uh, solve for wideband, even for wideband uh, observations, okay? Details in wideband observation, accounting for paradigm rotation and all this fancy stuff. Uh, the field that you want to use for for uh, as a as a calibrator source, okay. The antenna mounts. This is this is particularly interesting, okay. So when I developed this, uh, Casa couldn't handle Nasmith mounts, okay. So so I couldn't uh, generate 
ordinary CASA tables to be run by AppliCal because it was impossible for CASA to calibrate this, okay? So what I had to do is to, uh, to <laughs> develop an alternative approach, which is highly non-standard, okay? This is highly non-standard, which runs AppliCal uh, by itself, okay? So it, it has its own version of AppliCal, okay? Which writes in, into the corrected column. So, so, so this generates a DTERM table, but please do not use this DTERM table with, with the official apply cal because it will not work, okay? You have to run the uh, local implementation of apply cal that comes with Pulse Solve, okay? Which applies it uh, automatically, okay? And, and, and corrects the corrected column. Uh, DR Solve and DL Solve are also quite interesting keywords because it can be the case, there can be the case where you know the details of a subset of your antennas and you want to fix them, okay? You don't need to solve for them. And these uh, uh, array of booleans allow you to fix the antennas for which you already know the details, okay? And this is, I think this is a pretty powerful feature which is not present in LPCAL. You can also set here in DRDL those values that you already know or, the, or also the starting values for the, for the list squares minimization. Clean models is also a very important keyword. You can you you have a lot of freedom here to set whatever more you whatever model you like. Okay, you can set uh, a set of clean components. You can set CASA images. You can set it to the model column of the measurement set. You have a lot of freedom to define the subcomponents of your source or the polarization brightness distribution of your source, depending on the approach that you want to use to 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 fit for the polarimetry. So Pulse Solve actually uh, is, a, is a array of booleans as well, who tells the software whether you want to fit for the source polarization together with the DTERMs, or if you want to fix the model polarization, the, the source polarization, and just fit for the DTERMs, okay? So this basically uh, tells Pulse Solve which approach to use, the slicing approach of LPCAL or the polarization self-calibration approach, okay, if you set it to false. Target field, this is a very important one, because this, if you, if you set it, uh, to a given source, it will correct the data for that source and save the polarization corrected um, visibilities into the corrected column. Okay, so this is what runs the local version of AppliCal. Okay, if you don't set it to anything, you will not do anything actually. You will just compute the details, but they will not be applied to the data. And, and remember, you cannot apply it with the official AppliCal because it, as far as I know, it doesn't handle the antenna mounts properly yet, okay? Maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong, but when I developed this, it was not the case. Uh, it also had options to plot things, okay? To plot residual visibilities in phase or space, which I think can be quite useful, even a check for the quality of the polarization calibration. And also you can plot the parallactic angle coverage of the antennas to check whether there are antennas with poor parallactic angle coverage and so on. Uh, here you have an example, okay? I, uh, this, is, oh, this is not Sagittarius A, okay? This is a simulation, a simulated source with a random uh, brightness distribution, okay? So please don't take this as the real source, okay? This has nothing to do with Sagittarius A star, okay? This is a simulation of a jet core or core jet uh, structure uh, at the coordinates of Sagittarius A. I just use the coordinates, nothing else, okay? So <laughs> I insist this is not real data. This is a simulation. Um, where I uh, assign different fractional polarizations for the three blobs that you see here, okay? So the, if you want to apply the slicing approach with Pulse Solve, okay? So if you want to solve it the same way as LPCAL works, okay? The only thing you have to do is to first clean, of course, clean your source, then load it in the image viewer and define the regions where you want to fix the fractional polarization. This is just an example, okay? I want to slice it in, in, in five slices here and then one slice for this blob here okay you can play with the slicing we, you, okay well, you can you can change it as you like okay then the viewer has an option the, the casa viewer has an option to save the regions okay to have the set of regions that you have defined here okay i encourage i encourage you to use uh, the ds9 region file because if you use casa region file it's so silly that it doesn't have enough precision okay the, box, the coordinates of the boxes that are saved in the CASA region file are not precise enough. So the astrometry of your boxes will, will be basically of milli arc second scales, where, whereas here we are working, we are dealing with micro arc second scales. So it's as silly as that, okay? So in DS9 region file in pixel format, you can save the coordinates of all these boxes, okay, into an ASCII file, which can be loaded in, in the task CC extract, okay? This is the other task, another task that comes with poll tools, okay? You just specify the model image that you have cleaned, 
and the ASCII file that you saved, that you generated with the image viewer, okay? So these are where all the boxes are defined, okay? And you can set make plot true, which will basically plot this, okay? We'll plot the clean um, image together with the clean components, the locations of the clean components, colorized by subcomponent, okay? So in each color, you basically have the clean components that fell into each one of these boxes, okay? So different colors for different boxes. So what Polsol will do is to fit these uh, clean components by assuming the, fra the same fractional polarization for, for the components that have the same colors, okay? So same polarization for the same color, okay? Different colors, different polarization, okay? So CC extract is what it does, and it generates a set of ASCII files, okay, that then you can fill in into Polsol. So, okay, so this is the list of CC files generated by CC extract. I think that the best way to learn this is to do it, okay? So do it and you will see the details of, of, of all the files that are being generated and so on. Okay, this is the list of all files generated by CC extract. And this list is then given to PolSolve. Okay, so here you have the code to call PolSolve. Okay, these are the simulated data. These are the antenna mounts, okay, of the EHT antennas, Alt Azimuth, Nasmith right, Nasmith left, and so on. Here you see the all CCs is the clean models. So this is the keyword uh, uh, that contains all these files generated by CC extract. So this is our set of clean models. We want to fit for all of them. So PolSolf is true for all the subcomponents. So we will fit, fit for the polarization of all the subcomponents of the source. And the initial values will be unpolarized, OK? So the initial fractional polarization will be 0 with a 0 VPA. This is the starting values, OK? Linear approximation false. So I want to solve with using the full measurement equation. And then you just run this, OK? You just run PolSolf. And this is the output that you get, OK? So you get the estimates of the D terms estimates of the polarization of each one of the subcomponents, and also a CASA, a CASA calibration table, which is useless by now, okay, that uh, has the details on it. If you would have set a target field to M87 or to Sagittarius A star or whatever target you have, then the corrected column would have been modified, okay, and you would have the calibrated data ready for cleaning, okay? This is the correlation between the true D terms and the pulse of D terms obtained with this simulation. This is, uh, I remember it is one millimeter uh, simulated data of a, of a very rich polarization structure, okay? So the correlation is not that bad. Notice that the D terms that I have simulated are huge, okay? We are simulating D terms of the order of 40%. That, that's, that's, that's too much, okay? No, you normally find D terms of the order of 10%, order of 40%. I just, get wild, okay, to, to, in order to test the code to the limit, okay? And as you can see, even with a leakage of 40%, it handles very well, it works very well. If you wanna use the polarization self-calibration approach, which I think is easier, okay, and I, and I think it's even more powerful, but depending on the case, this is the code. As you can see, it's very simple. It's a very simple code. You just call tclean, okay? Beware of setting a Stokes to I, Q, U, and V because you need, we need the model of the four Stokes parameters, okay? So we generate uh, model images for all four Stokes parameters, and then we just call PulseSolve, okay? By setting clean models, you see clean models, instead of being a list now, is just a CASA model image. If you just give the CASA model image, okay, as an argument for clean models, PulseSolve will know, so will we'll, 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 uh, deduce that you want to use the polarization self-cal approach, okay? So it will set every, uh, so it will sell, set PulseSolve to false, will we'll arrange everything so that you are applying the polarization self-calibration approach. So we, this is as easy as this, okay? You iterate, this is the, this is the equivalent to, to hybrid imaging or self-calibration, okay? We clean and then we run PulseSolve by setting the clean models to the last model cleaned, okay? Of course, don't forget to set the target field. Target field to be the same source as the source that you are cleaning, okay? So what, it, what this will do is that tclean will use the corrected column, which will be updated each time you run PulseSolve, okay? So after you iterate a few times, here you see the correlation of true details versus pulse of details in the first iteration, second iteration, third, fourth, and fifth. You see how the details are converging to the true values as we keep iterating, okay? So this, this approach, I think it's pretty powerful. And as you can see, it's very easy to implement, okay? In a, in, a, in a CASA script, okay? 
And the last but not least, here is the source that I that I simulated, okay, which was tricky. It was a tricky source if you want to use the LPCAL approach, because in, here in the crosses, in the yellow crosses, you have the peaks of polarization, which are shifted with respect to the peaks of Stokes I, which is shown in contours. Okay, so these shifts here are very difficult to handle if you use the slicing approach. Because if you use the slicing approach, you assume that you have a proportionality be, 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 between a Stokes I and, and polarization brightness, okay? And, and this, as you can see, I have implemented the simulation in such a way that it is very, very hard to handle this, uh, to, 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 uh, to handle this, this modeling with the slicing approach, okay? This is the, the source simulated. You can see the EVPAs are different. You have a, a nice rotation of EVPAs, very rich structure, actually, okay? Very rich polarization structure. So uh, if, if, do we still have some minutes? Because I would like to show you the code working live, if you wanna, if we still have time. Um, you have 11 minutes. Oh, still, okay. So we, then we can have fun actually, live running the code live. Okay, Very so, good. but first of all, let's, let's give a summary. I hope I didn't run too fast. Um, so instrumental polarization can be decoupled from source polarization thanks to the earth rotation. I think this, this, we are lucky enough that the details rotate with the frames such that we can decouple one from the other, okay? We need this polarization, this, this rotation, this earth rotation to calibrate our data, okay? This is not like normal self-calibration, okay? This is more tricky than that. Polarization calibration in VLBI is especially tricky because there are structure effects from the calibrators, okay? We, we have resolved polarization calibrators and at the moment, there are several approaches to account for each for these structure effects. Okay, one of them is a family of algorithms uh, that would uh, be, be we could call inverse modeling. Okay, this is a la clean, let's say, where we retrieve the model from the data, and from this, the only known option, known from me. Okay, maybe you know of another option, but uh, as far as I know, the only known option for CASA would be pole solve. There are other options for Ace and Diff map like LPCAL and GPCAL. Uh, there is also the option of doing forward modeling, uh, where I would call a la MEM, okay, a la maximum entropy. Uh, uh, the, the paradigmatic example would be EHT imaging, the set of libraries um, developed for the Event Horizon Telescope. And you also have MCMC methods, which I would call a la brute force, because they basically scan the whole parameter space of source structure and D terms and antenna gains, everything together which is being implemented at the moment uh, that I know is, is in two softwares called Temis and DMC, also developed in the frame of the, of the Event Horizon Telescope. So remember that pole solve is an unofficial CASA task, okay, which applies the calibration directly into the corrected data column, okay? So please don't run apply cal after you have run pole solve because otherwise you will lose your, your calibrated data, okay? Um, this was due to some CASA limitations that I found when handling antenna mounts. And remember, this is a highly non-standard procedure. So you have to take it into account in, in your scripts if you are going to use pole solve, okay? Um, several algorithmic options are available in pole solve. You can either use subcomponent fitting or slicing, which is what is being used in LPCAL, or you can also use polarization self-calibration, okay? Inspired by, by, by the works of... Uh, of Bill Cotton 93, which is also being used in G by, by GPCAL. You can also use this approach with GPCAL. And I showed you examples of both, okay? So uh, what I would do now is, well, after showing the, the <laughs> thanks to the sponsors slide and make all these things legal, okay? <laughs> would be to jump to the, to the terminal, okay? And then run PulseSolve, oops, run PulseSolve live, okay? So, I have here the simulated data. You can simulate this, these observations with Pulse Simulate. Okay, actually, if you download the code, you will see that there is a directory here there called tests, okay, where you can actually download all the scripts that I have uh, used to generate the, 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 all the figures that you have seen in the, in the, in the talk, okay? So uh, let's start CASA. Okay, and now I will recover the last call to PulseSolve, so ticket PulseSolve, okay? And this was the last, these are the parameters in the last time that I run PulseSolve. We can briefly go through them, okay? This was the visibility, the measurement set, which was the simulated uh, Sagittarius star image, which has nothing to do with reality. 
Okay, it's just a core jet, random core jet structure. These are the antenna mounts of the EHT antennas. Okay, uh, feed rotation, you can also add if there is a constant feed rotation in any of the antennas, but, uh, but it's not, uh, no problem if you don't use it. It will just rotate the details, but the observables will be the same. Uh, so I leave everything free. So I solve for all deterns. I'm not fixing any, any detail of any antenna. Uh, ta -ta -ta -ta. Clean models is set to the, to the, to the clean model in the, in the, in the last self-calibration iteration. Okay. If you look at the scripts, you will see this is the image generated in the last, uh, self-calibration iteration. Okay. So I will load that model image into, into PulseOff and then just fit for the deterns. Okay. This is how it is uh, how it is set now, okay? It's to just fit for the D-terms, okay? I, I'm gonna set the plotting to true, okay? So in order to see, for instance, the parallactic angle coverage, so why you set plot parang to true, it will make a plot of the parallactic angles. And also I will set plot residuals to true so that we can take a look at the residual visibilities in phasor space. And you will see how, the, the, uh, how good the fit would be. Okay, so now if I just hit go, okay, it makes a lot of plots. And you see here, it performs a, a list of squares minimization. It converges. It tells us what are the D terms, okay? It also gives us some information about what it is doing, okay? So it's loading a Stokes I, 42 components, loading a Stokes Q, a Stokes U, okay? Model is taken from the MS model column because what it does is to write the, the, the model image into the model column is like FT, is like the CASA task FT, okay? But it's locally implemented, okay? And then what it, once it has it, 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 it just solves, okay? Solves for the, for the details using the fixed model of the source brightness distribution that was in the CASA model image. Now, let me show you the plots, the figures that have been generated. The first one is the, feed angle, not parallactic angle, but actually this is the feed angle, which accounts for not only the parallactic angle, but also the orientation of the feed with respect to, to the mount, okay? That, that's especially important for Nasmith mounts, okay? Which can Ivan, add- Ivan, you have five minutes. Okay, okay. Enough to show you the residuals, which is the, 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 the which are the actually, what I, what I think are the most interesting results. So here you have, oh, I moved. Here you have the, the data, okay? So these are the cross correlation, right, left, and left, right. Cross correlation, uh, uh, the, sorry, cross hand correlations of all baselines related to ALMA in this uh, EHT simulation, okay? Simulation of, e of the EHT data. These are the data. And if you look here, it's called residuals, okay? Here you have the residuals after fitting for the for the D terms, okay? This would be the baselines related to ALMA. So as you can see, almost all the signal can be modeled after the D term calibration, okay? This would be for Apex. You can see, wow, there, it works quite well. Look at all, all these rich structures here, which are being modeled quite satisfactorily. So Arizona, JCMT, okay? You can see the noise is, the noise simulation is actually Quite good as well. The LMT is very sensitive. You, you see a lot of signal to noise ratio here. Most of the signal, if not all, is being modeled. Pico Veleta, okay, you see, it's fantastic. So, so the fit is quite, is quite, uh, is quite good, okay, for the SMA. And last but not least, the South Pole, okay, where you also have. Uh, for the South Pole, is is quite uh, South Pole telescope is quite interesting because uh, since it's in the South Pole. You don't have uh, the parallactic angle doesn't vary with time; it's constant with time. So, so uh, um, it, it it has its own peculiarities when calibrating for the details of the South Pole, and uh, that would be it from my side. Right. Well, thank you very much, Ivan, for this very very nice talk. I will now and. Also in time, we have still three minutes to spare. So there's three minutes more to, for, for people to ask questions. So I give the, 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 the microphone to Mark, who's the question master. Mm -hmm. I am, but before I start with the questions, I think Ivan invited me to comment on, on the month uh, issue. So I'll do that. 
So um, since CASA 5.6, I think, um, actually all the common man types, parallactic angle implementations are there. Um, there's one that isn't there and that's the XY mount that was used in some of the uh, old NASA tracking stations that are now um, sometimes used for VLBI. And the only example of that that's still working, I think, is the Hobart telescope. So unless you have uh, Hobart in your array, um, all the parallactic angle corrections should be, uh, should be there. Um, which I think means that we should talk and, and see how we can change this such that it works a little bit more transparently and even just produces a, a calibration table that CASA then simply can apply for the D terms. Um, the reason why we didn't do that yet was because um, actually in the HT context, the parallactic angle correction was already applied to the data, which was a bit uh, uh, annoying because that did, doesn't fit very well into the CASA model. And also because in the EHT context, the, the uh, mount times weren't properly uh, um, labeled in the, in, the, in, the, in the data. And therefore you had to provide them manually yeah, exactly. anyway. Yeah. So it didn't make sense at that point to, uh, to, uh, to spend some effort on that. But if there are people indeed interested in, uh, in, in starting to use this for other arrays, um, I, think, uh, I think it makes, makes sense to, to spend a little bit of effort on that. Yeah, that's a good um, point. Because um, preemptively, um, there are plans to implement something similar as a proper ta CASA task in the official CASA distribution. Uh, George Mullenbrock, who is the CASA calibration guy, um, is very keen on doing that. Um, unfortunately, um, he doesn't really have much, very much time to work on that sort of projects. Um, so it may still take some time before that happens. So you want to uh, add anything to that, Mikael? Uh, uh, Mikael, uh, sorry, uh, Ivan. Yeah, well, um, that would be great actually to have an official an official task. Actually, yes, I would be very happy in order to compare what what I'm getting here with. Uh, I mean, wh when using the full measurement equation, for instance, which is uh, what the, the way the way to do it. There are other uh, other um, features in in Polsol that may that may make it a little bit more singular as compared as compared to, to other possible alternatives, which would be the possibility of using m multiple calibrators in the same feed. That I think can be very interesting for VLBI because sometimes you have very poor parallactic angle coverage in some antenna. And if you would use more than one calibrator, then you would break that degeneracy, for instance. That I think that's a, it's especially important for the South Pole, for instance. It would be great to use more than one calibrator so you scan more than one parallactic angle. And uh, also the possibility of, of using of using wide field D-term fitting, accounting for Faraday rotation, for instance. I think that this this can still make the program <coughs> interesting for the people, uh, even though we would have a, an official an official task. But, but I, in any case, I'm very keen to see uh, uh, that implemented in Polcal in Casa. I mean the structure contribution. Um. So with that out of the way, maybe we should go to the questions. So the first question is uh, from Paul. Can you, and if so, how could you measure linear polarization using VLBI? Measure? Except you, me you mentioned only doing circular polarization. Uh, no, no, I, 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 uh, I was talking about circular polarizers, which is the base that you use in your instrument to record your the, the front wave of the so, of the source that comes uh, from the sky. Okay, one th one one thing is the basis that you use to record the data and correlate them, and another thing is the polarization information that you retrieve 
from the correlations, from the VLBI correlations, okay? So we in VLBI, we, we, we usually use uh, circular polarizers, okay? This is what is usually done. Uh, and then from this, from the cross correlations between the circular polarization signals arriving at each antenna, from this, you can derive linear polarization information. Actually, in this, this image is reconstructed from, uh, by applying the, the, the measurement equation to the visibility matrix of this simulated data, okay? So this is linear polarization. So the red, the red lines here are the EVPAs, and in blue, you have uh, the, the level of polarization intensity, linear polarization intensity, okay? So you actually can retrieve information about linear polarization using circular feed receivers. There's no problem with it. Did I understand well the question or? I think, I think you did. And I think you answered it uh, excellent. Um, so then the next question is from Jolt. Um, he says, excellent talk. Um, and then he goes on, uncalibrated Q and U images are often dominated by artifacts from D terms rather than represent the true image. I am surprised this approach works. Me too. <laughs> well, I think, I think that it, 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 I don't think it, the convergence is guaranteed always, okay? And I think it, it would be interesting actually to study this systematically, okay? To increase and decrease the level of instrumental polarization, increase and decrease the intrinsic polarization of the source and see in which situations and which combinations uh, the procedure works better and worse. This, uh, this uh, kind of analysis to my knowledge is not published yet, but it I think it would be very interesting to, to, to look into that. So far, the, the few times I, I've applied it, though, it has worked pretty well, actually. Okay. So then the next question is from Miguel. So the model is a Stokes I model or all, all the IQ UV models are required? So it depends on which approach you want to use. So if you want to use the slicing approach, the LPCAL approach, okay, and divide the source in subcomponents and then fit the polarization of each subcomponent, then the model is only Stokes I, okay? You just need Stokes I. Whereas if you want to use this polarization self-calibration approach where you fix the source model and just fit for the instrumental polarization, then you need to have clean components in all four Stokes channels. So you need I, Q, U, and V. I think that's clear. Um, so the next uh, question is from Carolina. Um, thanks, Ivan, very interesting. In PulseSolve, I see that in the field parameter, there is a comment about the possibility of using multi-field. Yes. Is it possible to extract the D terms from multiple sources? Exactly, exactly, that's, that's the idea. So. It assumes that the, the D terms are the same for all sources, which I think is a basic tenet of, uh, of VLBI polarimetry, yeah? Uh, and then what it does is to combine data from all different calibrators. So, so th there's absolutely no constraint on the, on the locations of the calibrators. They can be spread around the, the whole sky, and it basically computes the geometry of the, of the, of the um, of the model at each independent direction. So there's absolutely no limits on this. And actually I have made simulations of, uh, for instance, geodesy-like observations, where you basically jump from one side of the sky to the other, and it works pretty well, actually. You gain a lot of signal to noise ratio in the details when you combine several calibrators. Because you are not biased by, by the structure effects of just one of them. You are kind of smearing all the systematics by combining different sources. Okay, well, Carolina already said that the question was, was answered, but I think you added some useful information to that. Um, and then the next uh, question from uh, the anonymous attendee is, if you have a point source, is it the same to use PulseSorf and T-Clean? Uh, you mean Paul, Paul's, uh, Paul Cal? Do you mean the, the CASA task? Or? Well, I, th I, think, I think that's, what's meant instead of T-Clean, because indeed... Uh, yeah, Paul Cal. Paul Cal can indeed do uh, the D solve for D terms for a point source. Yeah, exactly, exactly. They would be the same, yes. 
So would there would there still be a reason to use pull solve if you if your if your uh, cali polarization calibrator is point like or would well, that be, if, uh, for instance, if you uh, sorry, you have to <laughs> sorry, <laughs> it was the phone. <laughs> so. Um, so if you if you want to use several calibrators, for instance, if you have several point calibrators, then you would have an advantage in using pole solve because as far as I know, PolCal only handles one calibrator, whereas you could combine several calibrators. And also, there is another feature in pole solve called multi-IF fit, which actually can be used to gain a lot of signal to noise ratio. You have many IFs uh, on a given bandwidth because it forces the Stokes parameters to be the same on all on all IFs, but provides a different determined solution per IF, and that that's I think it's a, the optimum way of of handling uh, of handling multi IF data. That that feature I think is is not implemented either in in PolCal. So depending on the problem, you may prefer to use PolSolve or PolCal. Okay, then I have to check whether there's any further questions in the MetaMost. Ah, um, Christina is asking um, if you could also command on poll convert. Oh, wow. <laughs> I will need another lecture for that. <laughs> no, yeah, poll, poll convert was, uh, well, is uh, a software to actually convert uh, visibilities, PLBI visibilities, taken in linear polarization basis, okay? So, so it can basically, it's like pole solve, but, but uh, it's, it's similar to pole solve, but pole convert deals with uh, details that are huge, are, are, are really huge, okay? And, uh, and handles this kind of what we call mixed polarization visibilities, okay? Uh, which is a combination of circulars with linears and so on. So it's, they are similar, okay? They, they deal with the same thing with basically VLBI polarimetry, but on different ways. Yeah, pole convert is specialized for one particular problem, whereas pole solve is more generic. <laughs> oh, do you hear me? Um, no. Yeah, I, I thought I lost connection. <laughs> no, you are still there. Um, then there's a, a, a new question from Arjun. Um, if you do pole solve with self cal for the already known polarization source, can you recover the known polarization characteristics? Sorry, I didn't understand the question. What? If you what? If I I suppose I suppose the question is after you've done the pole solve, how well do you recover the polarization characteristics of your simulated source. Ah, okay, yes, yes, I understand now. So I, I thought the question was different. <laughs> okay, uh, um, so if the question would have been what I thought it was, okay, I thought you asked, how do you self-calibrate after applying pole solve? Okay, that's, that's, uh, that's the way I understood it. So once you apply once you apply pulse of you, if you want to continue self calibrating, you should be careful of applying the same gains to uh, both polarization channels. Okay, so apply the T mode gain. Okay, because because um, yeah because of several issues that uh, that we could discuss afterwards. So now the question was different. <laughs> it was different from what I thought. So uh, yeah, it depends on the quality of of the, your deconvolution algorithm. Okay, so. Using using T clean for the particular simulation that I showed here, the reconstruction is is very good. So it reflects very well what I was inputting into the simulation. Of course, it depends. It depends on on, on how you clean, on which weighting you use. For instance, the the, the masking depends on many things. Well, cleaning a Stokes parameters is tricky because you can have negatives. Okay, perfectly, you can have a negative Stokes Q and a Stokes U. Okay, it's natural to have them. So, so you have to be especially careful when doing that with, with, with clean. Mark, do you see other questions? I don't see any other questions anymore. 